and rules and my intro. I'm going to now introduce uh, Professor Eric Muller from Imperial College London. Um, Eric is the Professor of Thermodynamics, uh, which was never my favourite subject, so I'm hoping I can learn a lot today, uh, at the Chemical Engineering Department at Imperial College. Uh, he tells me he's got over 30 years experience, he doesn't look that old, um, in uh, describing um, fluid, complex fluids and um, interfaces at the molecular level. He's involved in a number of BP ICAM projects, notably ICAM 10 and 15, leading the modeling work in there. Um, and um, it's been with us since, I think, the beginning, Eric, um, of ICAM. Um, I'm not going to say any more, but just to let Eric start and tell us a little bit about the molecular simulation of fluids. Over to you, Eric. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sheetal, and thank you for um, the... the the audience we have. We have also a, a full house here at Imperial, so it, it, it's uh, very pleasing to see this. Um, I'll, I'll start this talk, as, as I've started others, um, mentioning a, a comment that uh, Richard Feynman, uh, for those of, for the younger ones in the audiences, you probably don't know that he is, uh, he was a Nobel Prize winner in, in, in physics. Um, and, and he made a, during his talks, he, he had made, he made a very nice uh, uh, open question. And he basically says, what, what would it happen if, if for some strange reason all of the scientific knowledge was wiped out of, of, of humanity? And you had the chance of writing on a piece of paper just one sentence that could be passed on to the new generations of, of humans or whatever was left in, in the world. And what would you write in that single sentence? What, what could you do to write something that was so physically meaningful and could convey enough information for them to start on, on the right track? And of course, there's many, many people joke on, on what they would write, you know. But um, if you think of it, uh, it, it, is, it is quite a difficult task to, to summarize things in just one sentence. And actually, his, his proposal for that sentence was uh, basically the uh, atomic hypothesis or, or the atomic fact, or, or the fact that all, all matter is made of atoms or little particles. And, and if we know the, and we understand the behavior of these atoms and we study them, we can obtain a lot of information about basically everything that surrounds us, including even aspects which, which seem uh, uh, quite unusual. So, um, in, in that sense, um, th this, is the, this talk is going to talk about uh, understanding the behavior of matter through the molecular modeling, at, especially at that atomistic scale. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to, to mention that this is a rather introductory talk, and I apologize for those who, who want uh, the hardcore science, but there's a limit of the amount of information that we can put in one, in one hour. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to give first an outline on on what it, what simulation means and what people understand as simulation, and then I'm going to start focusing on the most basic form of, of molecular modeling, which is uh, molecular dynamics. Uh, what does it mean? What can we do, and what can't we do with it? And then start from there, noticing that there are improvements that we can make in terms of, for example, speeding up things and using coarse grain models, or even better, linking linking up with other scales of of modeling as as multi scale modeling. Um, as Sheetal already mentioned, I will be using some examples taken from our recent work in ICAM 10, ICAM 15, and uh, with some EPSRC funded uh, projects. So the first question is, is what is, uh, what is simulation? And simulation means different things for different people. And that's what we have to put the, the record straight uh, to start with. Um, for, for the classical chemical engineer, uh, simulation will mean looking at things in spreadsheets and, and modeling plants and, and, and chemical plants uh, with the use of computers. Uh, for a, a hardcore chemist, uh, computational chemist, uh, the only form of uh, computer simulation is to do quantum simulations and understanding uh, Schrodinger's equations of motions. And between those two extremes, we have a wide variety of different uh, uh, scales of understanding and, and uh, matter. Um, and uh, what this slide tries to show is the fact that we, we, spe we can span several length scales and several time scales with different types of um, modeling techniques. And I'll go through each, each, and each one of these uh, with a, a little bit of detail just to describe what these different scales are and what these different uh, lengths and time scales actually mean. So as I said, the first one is, is quantum mechanics, which is 
probably the most elegant one. It's an ab initio uh, t technique. Basically, it start, doesn't need anything uh, to, to start with. Um, it's ex essentially an exact numerical solution of Schrodinger's equations. And uh, as such, it's extremely uh, computationally heavy. Uh, up to now, we can only do that for only a few simple systems and, and rather uh, interesting from a theoretical point, but probably not too much from a practical point of view or maybe an engineering point of view if you want to look at it that way. However, we can make a few simplifications to quantum theory and, and, and basically one of them uh, carries on to what is known today as density functional theory. It's extremely popular um, technique. Um, basically, it can allow us to understand uh, the, 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 the behavior of the electron clouds around a, a fixed nuclear. And um, it can, we can talk now about looking at maybe hundreds of atoms and even thousands of atoms if you have the correct hardware. Um, there's two issues uh, with respect to, to DFT particularly. Uh, the first one is it's, 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 it's quite curious, but uh, in the case of DFT, you have to define some wave functions for the electrons. And um, it, it just happens that uh, if you want to increase your precision, um, going into more complex wave functions doesn't necessarily guarantee success. So it, it comes to a conundrum in which you don't really know how to improve your model, because making it more complex doesn't necessarily provide a better solution. Uh, so you're stuck with, 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 uh, with an, a, a crucial unknown, which is how to improve on, on, my, on my answer. A second one, not probably, probably uh, not uh, also equally important, but maybe with, with has a, a, a closer solution, is the fact that dispersion interactions, which are for most engineering applications crucial in, the, in, in terms of, of forming condensed phases or, or self-assembly, uh, are not well taken into account with, with a simple DFT. And, and quite complicated uh, uh, strategies have to be taken into account to, to account for this. Um, uh, as an example taken from, again, from ICAM 15, uh, we were looking at the absorption of, of toluene on, on cementite, which is a, a, a solid surface. And in this case, you have toluene as, as a, a, a dark painted uh, molecule. And the type of information that we can extract from these uh, DFT calculations are, for example, the absorption energies. And the, in, in, in the top right cartoon, you see what the, the absorption of a toluene molecule is lying flat on the surface in the order of 200 kilojoules. And on the, on the, on the, bottom, on the bottom two uh, figures, you have the absorption of two molecules or dimers uh, absorbing on the surface. And one, one thing, two things are, for example, immediately obvious from here. One of them is that um, the absorption of the fluid-fluid interactions between two toluene molecules are much smaller than the interactions of the solid, because the, the dimer interacts with around um, uh, 200 uh, kilojoules per mole, 266 kilojoules per mole, while the single molecule has around 200 joules of, of absorption energy. So the absorption between, the interaction between the two fluid molecules is, is, in, is in order of magnitude smaller than the solid uh, interaction. And the other one is that orientation does matter, and there is, a, again, a significant difference between the fact that the molecules lie flat on the surface and lie vertically. Of course, much more information can be gathered pr from this, um, but I'm just giving you an example of the size and the scale of the classical systems that we, we explore. Obviously, this is uh, probably uh, too little to study, for example, condensation of, of, of a liquid in a surface, and much, uh, much too smaller if you want to see self-assembly or or bigger, um, bigger effects. So we have to turn into um, a higher scale, a coarser scale, one in which we can uh, see a little bit more of, um, lose a little bit of detail, but, un but attack a lot larger systems. And this is, corresponds to the, to the avenue of, of atomistic modeling. Here, we atoms and molecules are taken distinctively as points of mass. Um, usually, for example, a CH3 group can be, can be considered as or taken as, as a sphere. In the cartoon on the top right-hand hand, right hand side, you can see absorption of water on, on, an, uh, on an oxygenated surface, for example. And now you can immediately see that we're talking about larger number of particles that we can study because the interactions are now uh, much simplified. Instead of looking at the full interactions between, between the molecules as given by quantum mechanics, we take basically uh, an empirical force models, which uh, somehow 
uh, fit that uh, distribution, that energy distribution, and we use them uh, directly in our, in our calculations. Um, we will deal a little bit more on optimistic model in, in further on, but I'll give you here a, a, an example of the types of things that we were looking at. Um, in this case, we have a water flowing through a, a, um, a sheet, the graphene sheet, which has a perforation in the middle. One of the water molecules is highlighted for you to try to see it, and there is a flow of water, believe it or not, from your left-hand side to your right-hand side. Um, uh, the immediate thing that you can see is that it doesn't flow like the water that, uh, off your tap. Uh, you see that there are interactions between molecules, and these interactions are the ones that, 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 that mediate everything. And the other one is finally water is trying to just push through the hole, and we, have to, we all have to think together hard. If we think together hard, we'll probably see that water molecule just finally make it through and uh, get to the other side. Okay? Um, so what I wanted to point out also with this, uh, with this slide um, is that the hydrodynamics is not captured by this. Uh, the scales are too small. We're looking at atomistic scales. We're looking at, at molecules in, 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 in a small system. So, so, and, and there's lots of details which are probably unnecessary. We modeled a lot of the water-water interactions. We modeled a lot of, of things which were not of, of real interest. And, and we might have been able to get this picture faster if we had a thought about um, coarse grain. Coarse graining refers to uh, deleting some of the atomistic detail in our model, which for some reason is uh, slightly irre uh, irrelevant. Um, the example shown on the, on the top of the slide is of a big macromolecule um, uh, in which uh, made out of different benzene centers connected together to form something like a hollow ring. And this is basically a liquid crystal. Um, and uh, modeling atomistically would take uh, an enormous amount of computing power to, to take into account all these atoms and all the interactions between these atoms. Uh, but by simplifying or taking a, co a coarse-grained approach on, on, on this molecule, by lumping together different atoms in, in, in a single bead, uh, we can then start seeing, uh, for example, the, the behavior of the system. This particular system produces a, a smectic, um, uh, smectic phase, or phase, a liquid crystal phase that has structure, um, with, uh, with the rings uh, interpenetrating one, one, one against the other, forming uh, some nice, um, beautiful layers. Um, and this, of course, would be impossible to see in, in, in the time scale of, of an atomistic simulation. Um, uh, when we reach these scales of coarse grain, and you probably recognize that we're very far from the quantum level where we had you know, some assurances that we're doing things correctly. Uh, so that's, uh, there is a risk that when we go up these scales and we integrate and integrate every time and we, we smooth and smooth, and we, we might be throwing away some details which are important, then we might just be losing a little bit of the physics. So the, uh, GIGO, the risk of GIGO is, 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 is clear here, the garbage in, garbage out in our simulations. We have to be very sure at this, at this level that we're doing things correctly. And again, I'll discuss a little bit more of that uh, later on when we talk about coarse grading. Um, I'd like, again, to show you another example in, in terms of a, the use of a liquid crystal. In this case, it is, it is a T-shaped liquid crystal formed by a, a rigid central core, which is aromatic, which basically doesn't move. It looks like a pencil. And at, the, at both ends, um, we have polar groups, very um, groups which like to form hydrogen bonds and, and like to bond with each other. Um, the, laterally, on this molecule, there is a fluorinated chain. And curiously, this, this fluorinated chain, or this, this fluorinated part of the molecule, hates the other parts of the, of, of the same molecule. So it, it, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of a molecule itself, uh, it, 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 it's a very strange one. It hates, it hates itself in, so, in some way, but it likes itself and other parts. If we let this liquid crystal um, evolve in time, if we do the modeling of the evolution in time, and we see that the liquid crystal will self-assemble. And you can start seeing here in a plot of the order parameter as a function of time how it has slowly started to form a, a, a distinct phase. And suddenly there's a jump at this point, and immediately it forms a, a hexagonal honeycomb structure. Uh, so a tubular, two-dimensional structure, um, self, completely self-assembled. Uh, and this, of course, corresponds with what we see with, from X-ray diffractions on this, on this exact same molecule. What is interesting to note, for example, is that uh, before we did these uh, simulations, people tried to do these, uh, 
to, to do these simulations with fully atomistic models. And um, they couldn't see the self-assembly, and they couldn't prove what was going on. And um, by looking back at their work, it, what, it just happened that uh, they were uh, not spanning time, uh, a long enough time. They're spanning, the, at the most, a few nanoseconds of simulation time with atomistic models. And if you can see from the graph, at five nanoseconds, you basically don't see any ordering in, in the system. So you really had to span long time scales, which was something that could, have been, that could be done by simplifying the model and, and, um, and, and performing longer, uh, longer sizes and uh, longer times. If we keep going up in the, in the ladder of, of knowledge, uh, we have a continuum model. So in, 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 in the case of continuum models, uh, now the atomistic detail is completely lost. We're now looking at the solution of, of basically Navier-Stokes equations and, and, and um, energy equations in, in a continuum phase. Um, this is, of course, accurate in as long as we have the correct thermodynamics and transport coefficients uh, input to it. Uh, so it is not, it's not an ab initio situation. Uh, it's, uh, it's a situation which simply follows what we somehow know usually experimentally. Lattice-Boltzmann techniques, for example, fall in this category. Uh, and again, they're, 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 uh, in the case of Lattice-Boltzmann, there is a speed up in, t in, in terms of having a continuum, the continuum being discretized in time, and the, and the solutions of these um, mass and energy equations being solved in, in a lattice rather than a continuum. Uh, for those in the audience in the, in the oil and gas industry, reservoir simulations also fall within this, this, loosely within this category. Um, as an example, I'd like to show you one uh, thing done in the group of Omar Matar here at Imperial College, which is the asphaltene deposition on, on hot pipes. In this case, we have a crude oil, which, is, which, uh, which has some asphaltenes in it. And uh, when passed through a hot pipe, uh, the, the temperature of the walls will start um, um, precipitating the, the asphaltenes and uh, eventually coking them. And, and, and eventually the pipes will start clogging up, much in the way as, as cholesterol clogs the pipes of the arteries of, of a normal human being. Um, the, the, the CFD is, is very appealing. It is physically and visually uh, uh, appealing. And you can actually see, what's, uh, without too much explanation, what's happening in the system. And you can probably understand it. Um, in, in that sense, it's, it's a really powerful tool. But it's important to recognize that it does only what you want, what you tell it to do. Uh, hence, if in this case, for example, we have to give it the the rates of deposition, we have to give it the kinetic models, we have to give it all that information, which in principle is unknown. Uh, so, so you have something which is uh, very detailed, but you have to give it a lot of information for it to to be realistic. At the end of the spectrum, and I'm not going to talk too much about this, is the classical chemical engineering uh, point of view in which we, we have a spreadsheet and we can take a very large process and break it up into small unit operations which are connected uh, through mass and energy balances. Um, this is usually not considered molecular modeling. However, I, I included it because there is a, a, a brand new a tendency to try to link these, uh, these big scale operations with more molecular understanding of matter and even with the smaller scales of molecular modeling as we do right now. The area is, is, it has been coined by our group as molecular systems engineering and is an emergent field where, where this type of, of linkage has happened. It's, it's very difficult to do, uh, but on the other hand, it's quite exciting because it would allow us to, do, to take uh, some of the things which are only seen by academics into probably what some people would call the real world or, or, the, academic, or the, the engineering world. So let's go into the, the core of the talk, which is the, the modeling at the scales that we, at the, at the atomistic scales. The first one and the easiest one is the molecular dynamics. And in molecular dynamics, uh, we're basically solving Newton's equations of motions for all particles. Uh, it's, it's an n-body problem, uh, but it's a, it's a relatively simple uh, from, the point, from, from the conceptual point of view. Um, so we'll go through it with, with a little bit more of, of detail. Uh, what we're basically doing are computer experiments. And uh, for those that come from a lab, you'll recognize that in a lab, every experiment has basically three parts to it. There is a preparation of the material. There is a connection of that sample to, to something, that, that's to an apparatus, which is going to measure something. 
And there's a third part, which is a measurement of the property or the analysis of what the, the result came. And the molecular dynamic simulation is very similar to this. Basically, it's a pseudo-experiment, although we, we, we don't like to call them that way, but, but definitely there is a parallelism. And, and basically, there's three parts to it. The first one is to select the model uh, that we want to study and choose a force field for that model. The second one is to place in an instrument, in this case it's our computer, and basically, and, and our software. And basically we solve Newton's equations of motions for these, for these particles, and until we see that the system accelerates or reaches some steady state. And finally, at the end, we do something with that. We, we, we calculate a certain property, we average a property over time, and if necessary, we repeat the experiment several times uh, to get um, better statistics. So taking, again, an example from the ICAM, um, from the I, uh, ICAM um, projects, uh, one of the projects is on the deposition of carbonaceous substances on surfaces. And uh, amongst them, one of the interesting compounds is our asphaltines. Asphaltines, for those, for those in the audience not clear on this, are large uh, organic molecules which appear in crudes, uh, which due to their size, uh, given some correct uh, conditions of temperature, pressure, and composition, precipitate or separate out of the, of, of the crude oil, causing enormous problems in, in, in production. Um, the problem we have, for example, in this case, is that the object of study, basically the molecules, are unknown. Um, in, in chemical and biological sciences, we're very clear on what, the, the, what we're studying. We're studying a certain molecule, we're studying a certain um, protein in a certain very well-defined system. In this case, the, we only have an idea of what the basic chemical composition of asphaltines are. And by several different experimental uh, avenues, we have some clues on what these molecules look like. Uh, but basically, we're stuffed with the problem that we don't know what, what we can't describe a molecule. So in this particular case, out of many millions of different uh, possibilities, uh, I'm going to keep talking about asphaltine C, which is on the right-hand side of, of, of your slide, for no particular reason. Uh, simply because we, at some point, we just have to choose one and start looking for one. Um, the second thing we need to do is describe the force field or describe the, the, the energetics between the different parts of this molecule and, uh, and other molecules. Here we, we struck luck. And in this case, uh, there are several uh, force fields available, ma many dating back to the, actually to the 60s, where the, basically the start of modern uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulation uh, it can be traced back to. Uh, several of these force fields are available, uh, and I, I might say not thanks to us, but basically they have been uh, imported from biochemistry, where they have been really uh, very, very successful. Uh, they, they're based on, on, a, on a very clear uh, idea of group contribution, basically that uh, different groups of molecules, for example, a CH3 group in a given molecule is always going to behave it the same way. And we can transfer that CH3 group, for example, from an alkane to a protein, or to a, a smaller molecule. The, the force fields are, are rather simple in, in, in their constitution. They're based on point to, uh, at, at, uh, they're based on, on dispersion forces of between two types of molecules. They're based on um, charges, point charges um, between groups of molecules and a set of rules with, with respect to the bond stretching and bond bending and bond torsion. And um, most modern force fields have basically this structure, which can be attributed basically to the three Nobel Prize winners of, of 2013. Actually, they won the Nobel Prize because of these, this contribution to, to, the, to this field. Um, so now we have the, 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 the description of the molecules, we have the force fields, and then the next thing is to how to solve these things in a computer. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it, it's as simple as solving this apparently innocuous uh, equation. The force equals the gradient of the, um, of the potential. And the fact that, of course, the force is the acceleration of the second derivative of the position, of the position with respect to time. So basically, we have one equation for each m molecule or atom in the system, it's, uh, and we have a, sec uh, a set of second order different, coupled second order differential equations. So that sounds like a, a big task, but in, in general, it is uh, it is rather s uh, repetitive. Uh, it is simple, in, the, in, in, in from the math point of view, it is, however, a very repetitive uh, task. 
it can't be solved exactly, so it must be solved discreetly by uh, dis discretizing time and solving for these equations of motions in, 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 in delta t's of time. Um, here you have uh, now now uh, a simulation of exact of that asphaltine molecule now in in, in toluene. We have 27 asphaltine molecules for around 7 percent uh, weight. And, and th at these conditions, the system is unstable in the sense that it precipitates, or or or, he or the asphaltines are expected to precipitate. And you can see that they're starting to stack one on top of the other, like cards, like deck cards. And um, if we give the system time long t time enough. Uh, you'll actually see the whole system cluster into one big uh, cluster. So this, this simulation you're seeing here has, has many of the uh, elements uh, erased from it, so you can actually see something. Um, all, the, all the solvent, for example, is deleted just for, for observation purposes. Uh, and you're only seeing a, a small snapshot of the whole simulation. The whole simulation took half a nanosecond of, 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 of time of, uh, uh, of, of real uh, of real time um, for real I mean in term for mole molecular time and uh, it, I, ca I call it here a heroic simulation it's it's almost an order of magnitude larger than the largest simulation reported uh, in the literature um, and, and even then you I'll, I'll convince you that even then this is not uh, large enough it took the, the poor postdoc over a month of CPU time just to get this uh, this amount of information and and and, uh, and and the part of the movie that you're seeing. Um, in the the next part of a simulation is then to understand what's going on, to to actually measure something and to see what what we're obtaining. So in this slide, you have two the behavior of the system in two in two in two solvents in toluene and heptane. In toluene, the system is soluble. In heptane, the system separates into two phases. In red, you have the first 100 nanoseconds of the simulation. In green, you have the last 100 nanoseconds of the 500 nanoseconds. Uh, you see that in toluene, nothing is really happening. From at 100 nanoseconds, we have a distribution in terms of the cluster size, which is the, the variable we have at the, at the uh, abscissa. Um, molecules just cluster in, in, in pairs, in, trim in, in trimers, etc. But they don't advance much more, and there is no further clustering. In heptane, on the other hand, you see that uh, the simulation, you, the picture you saw, the movie you saw, was for the uh, red slide, for the red curve, and you see that there is a clustering. If we had left that five times longer, you would have seen that the clusters would be larger and larger and larger. This is by far the largest simulation we, we can do, and it's still pathetically uh, not enough. It's too small a system. It's a simple, it's a simple solvent, and the time simply is, is pointing to us that we really need to just, uh, explore larger time frames. So um, did we run in, in the fastest computer available? Well, yes, we did. And the, those simulations were run in the BP cluster. Um, here's another example of another uh, simulation done by a, a PhD student in our group in which they wanted to calculate the critical micelle concentration of a surfactant in water. This is an etoxylated surfactant, very much the one that you find in your in your basic uh, toothbrush or, 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 or hand washing soap. Um, the, the critical micelle concentrations, or the, the concentration at which the surfactants form these beautiful little spheres uh, um, in which they, they trap the, 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 the oil or whatever you want to, to take out of your, your hands, um, are very, very small. They're usually in the order of, of parts per million or uh, 10 to the minus 6. Uh, so the, the system sizes that we need to explore are enormous. In this particular case, it, it was uh, we needed to talk about more than a million uh, atomic centers to try to do the simulation. So this was done particularly in this case in, in Titan, in, in the um, Oak Ridge Natural, National Labs uh, supercomputer. And the graph you have on, on the left-hand side is the best that we can do. Um, uh, on the abscissa, we have uh, the number of nodes in the system. And each node corresponds to 16 uh, processors. So basically, it's one of your, your high-end workstations is one node. We're talking about scaling this up to 128 in this particular case. And you see that there is a linear scale-up in the, in the power that we can do. The, the, the ordinate talks about um, millions, millions, million atom time steps. So, so that's uh, one time step for a million atoms per second. 
Uh, so, so the more we get, the, the better. Uh, uh, an interesting slide, uh, and an interesting part of that slide is a red line. The red lines are GPUs. GPUs are graphical processor processing units, which are cards which are originally designed to, to play uh, computer games, uh, but basically are very powerful because they have around the order of 2,000 processors, which help speed up cal computations. So when we activate the GPUs on each one of those nodes, immediately you see uh, a jump in one or two orders of magnitude in terms of the computational power, especially for the smaller systems, and which is something that we're exploiting now uh, quite, quite a lot. So we need to speed things up. That's, that's, a, that's a message. So there are several ways of speeding things up, and you can immediately, we've discussed a little bit, one idea is to, to uh, fudge out some of the detail. And in the bottom part of the slide, you have a picture of water, of, of, of bulk water. And then again, you see the, the, the characteristic red and, and white uh, uh, signature of, the, of, of, of how we as modelers uh, draw water with the hydrogens and, and the oxygens. Um, but you could, take, you could say water, well, we don't want that much detail. Let's, let's fudge it out into a sphere, which is what's happening when you look at the red spheres in the right-hand side. And one way to do that is, well, let me see if I can reproduce some of the structure of water, in this case, the radial distribution function, or um, um, in, in simple terms, the, the local density as a function of distance of the different molecules. So if we, if we match the, the, our, our red beads to that radial distribution function, we get a certain functional form for the potential, which then we can later use in our simulations. So by doing that, we, we solve many of the problems associated with modeling water. Um, water has a long range of electrostatics, has three atoms, has hydrogen bonding, and all of these things could, in principle, in principle, uh, be washed out by a coarse grade model. Another way of doing more or less the same thing is instead of looking at, at, at structure, we could look at forces. If we have a polymer, for example, like the one drawn here, we could try to match the forces between two of these polymers and assign these forces to larger centers of force. Um, finally, we could think of, um, we could take a little bit of the idea of coarse grain, of, 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 sorry, of group contributions and, and think about something like a, a Lego box in which for each group of atoms, we have a larger uh, atom center. And this atom center has certain characteristics which we fit, in this case, in the case of the Martini force field, they're fitted to water oil partition coefficients. And uh, with that, we have a table in which we can build the, the different molecules. Um, all of these coarse grading um, models have big issues with them. Uh, the three big issues are representability, robustness, and transferability. Uh, representability is basically the, the it refers to the fact that if we fit to one state point, uh, most likely, in most cases, these, um, uh, this information is state dependent. So when we want to use it for other temperatures and other pressures, uh, it won't work. The example of water that I gave you is a classical example where that is, is an, an important uh, factor. Another one is the robustness. We want it uh, to uh, be, be able to not only describe one property, but we want to use it to describe uh, thermodynamic properties. We want to use it to describe transport properties, etc. And transferability is what I mentioned in terms of the uh, group contribution model that the CH3, for example, part of a molecule can be used for other, in other different molecules uh, all around. So we have, in, in our group, we have looked at uh, attacking this problem from a completely different point of view. Um, we have uh, used an, an equation of state. And an equation of state is an analytical closed form expression for the free energy of a fluid. And it's, it's a classical, it's used classically in, in chemical engineering uh, to provide a route to describe the thermophysical properties of a fluid in, a, in an analytical way. And, and for those, in, in, for those uh, physicists in the, in the audience, uh, the van der Waals equation of state is a classical uh, antique example of, 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 this tech, of this idea. The equation of state we use, the SAFT equation of state, which stands for Statistical Associating Fluid Theory, um, links directly um, the equation of state to an underlying intramolecular potential. So the way that the equation has been derived is to think of, of molecules and, 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 and atoms interacting through a, a potential. And uh, the, the theory is developed from that potential onwards. 
So at the end of the day, we have an equation of state which certainly is in terms of macroscopic properties, but the parameters refer to, to microscopic uh, parameters of the force field that's underlying it. Um, the, the theory follows very well that, that underlying Hamiltonian. Um, and in this slide, you see examples of, of three things on the, on the same slides. The solid line is the equation of state prediction. The, the dashed lines are the experimental, the experiments, and you can see here that we are theoreticians, we're not experimentalists, so we just put dashed lines for, for experiments. And um, the, the simulations are, are seen as, as open circles. The simulations are done with exactly the same parameters that come out from the theory. So the, the, the take home message here is that um, we can have the same level of precision with the equation of state than we can do with the simulation in fitting experiments. So immediately you can start thinking of flipping the problem around, which we've already done, uh, and basically saying, well, if we have experimental data and we have this equation of state, can we fit these parameters to the, that experimental data and obtain an intermolecular potential? So now we're actually taking an in, uh, uh, fitted parameters or intermolecular potential, which is actually a, a very good average of all the thermophysical properties of a given compound. So it represents in a very good, way, good averaged way, and in this case, average coarse-grained way, the effective interaction potentials for the, these systems. And we can use them in molecular simulations. Of course, we could use them to obtain the same properties that the equation of state finds. But more interestingly, we can use it to study interfacial properties, transport properties, mesophases, et cetera, et cetera. Examples of how we would do that, or the level of coarse grading, are on the slide. Uh, for example, benzene can be modeled, for example, as a single sphere. And we would do that by looking at the properties of benzene and backtracing then the, the parameters that we would need to model the thermophysical properties of benzene. Those parameters we could use then directly in, into a simulation. Uh, the model is, 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 um, can be used, again, as in, in, in a Lego fashion by putting together different particle, different types of, of, of model, mo molecules to form larger molecules. Um, and we have tested that and, and with, with certain success. And uh, we, by now, then, we have tables and tables of, prop of, of parameters for different uh, chemical moieties or molecules or groups of, of, of particles. So let's go back to our asphaltine model, or our asphaltine system. So in this case, this was the atomistic version of our, at, our atomistic model. And then we simply um, build a, a coarse grain model out of the table, for example, that I just showed you. And uh, what can we do? Well, the first thing that's obvious is the number of calculations needed for this model uh, decreases substantially. And on the left-hand side, we have the order of 10,000 uh, calculations per each pair. Uh, so we're, we have to scale this times n to the square if we want to look at larger systems. On the right-hand side, you have several orders of magnitude less interactions to look at for each pair. So the simulations, those heroic simulations which took us months to do on the, on, on the large BP supercomputers can now be done on, on a worktop uh, desk, uh, on, on a desktop uh, in a in matter of hours. So this, th these are the results that uh, I asked uh, uh, Guadalupe Jimenez, one of our uh, uh, post, uh, postdocs in, in the group, uh, to do for this uh, talk, and she did them overnight on, on, on her computer. Uh, you can see that the physics is still there, it's exactly the same one, but the interesting thing is, of course, that these, the time and length scales that we can now uh, use are, are, are incredible. Uh, for example, we can look at more complex systems instead of looking at binaries. In this case, we have uh, the, the bubble point or the, or the vapor-liquid equilibrium of a 10-component uh, crude oil mixture. Uh, we have a simulation and predicted experimental, uh, the, sorry, the, the simulation results, which are complete predictions as compared to the uh, experimental results. And we find that the, even to the level of, of, of details in the composition, uh, we, we get it right. We can get interfacial tensions from the system. Um, the, the graph on the left-hand side um, shows oh, the, the predictions from the simulations. The blue dots are our simulations. And the red dot is the only experimental data point available. Um, the, the solid lines are, uh, are engineering equations of state fit 
to uh, those data. So, so those equations of state have fitting parameters, while the blue lines are just simple, the blue dots are just simple um, predictions. Um, we can also look at uh, more complex systems. For example, in this case, we were looking at a 16 component crude oil. This is a live crude oil for which we had some, informa some uh, experimental information. Uh, we're talking here about uh, an equivalent of one million atoms um, in which we have a large number of asphaltine and resin molecules. In this particular snapshot, you can see that the, the aggregation of the asphaltines in, in, in one part of the, of the simulation, the, the purple ones. Um, the interesting thing is, again, the, the, the size and complexity of the system, which is basically run on a, works, on, on a, on a GPU workstation. Um, not, even, not even the largest. Uh, this is not the largest that we can do by, by no means. Um, however, uh, something that probably is, 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 is already coming to light is the fact that, that we really are sometimes uh, limited by the tool that we use and the size of what we're looking at. Uh, and different problems will probably need to have different uh, um, microscopes or different instruments to understand what we're seeing. Uh, and uh, the, the, it's my belief that the way forward in, in, in modeling is to look at multi-scale modeling, to use more than one tool to study the different parts of different length scales in, in a coherent way. Uh, I might mention, by the way, that this, does, this is slightly different than what people call adaptive modeling, in which you uh, run simultaneously two simulations. For example, you could run a continuum simulation and a molecular dynamic simulation at the same time, uh, cross-feeding information for both uh, as the run goes forward. So this is an ex that, that particularly is an extremely challenging area of research which is actually um, being pursued uh, by, by many people nowadays. I'll give you as an, an example something that comes out from ICAM-10. In this case, ICAM-10 is interested in producing membranes for purifying water uh, for reverse osmosis applications. The, the, the chemical way of producing these uh, polyamide membranes is well known. Uh, we start with, um, with the two monomers here labeled MPD and TMC with the names are there on the slide if you want, if you want the, the, the chemistry. Um, and uh, it happens that one of the monomers is usually dissolved, the TMC is usually dissolved in an organic phase, in this case, hexane. Um, the other monomer is solvent in, in, in an aqueous phase. And of course, you know hexane and water will, will phase separate into two phases. Interestingly enough, uh, MPD is also soluble in, in the organic phase. So when the two phases are put together, the MPD, which is soluble in the organic phase, permeates or diffuses into the organic phase where it encounters the TMC, reacts, and forms the membrane. So this is sometimes called interfacial polymerization. The system itself is too complex to study atomistically. There's too many things going on. We have diffusion. We have chemical reaction. We have two phases. Um, we, we have the, the effects of the solvent on both sides. We have uh, the evolution of the, uh, of, of the products of the reaction, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, no way, uh, there's no way that we can solve it because the time scales are too, 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 dis too distinct. And, and the, times, the, the, the size scales are too distinct. I mean, we have the membrane growing, and we have the, the, the time scales associated with the chemical reaction. We have the time scales associated with the diffusion, et cetera, et cetera. We chose to do some very aggressive coarse graining uh, for this model. In this case, uh, we, used, uh, we coarse grained our models using basic the, the SAFT approach I've mentioned before. Uh, but we used something called a Langevin dynamics. Uh, in, in the case of Langevin dynamics, what we do is uh, not uh, remove the solvent from the problem. In this case, hexane and heptane are doing nothing. Sorry, hep uh, the, the organic phase in water are doing nothing. They're, they're just simply uh, laying this, the, the, this, the, the ground for these two monomers to, to come together and, and react. Uh, so what we did was extract the solvent from our problem, take the solvent away. In the equation from Langevin dynamics, which you have in the middle of your slide, you can start recognizing mass times the gradient of the velocity or the, or the acceleration, so that's a force, is equal to, and in the, in the middle of the right-hand side, you see the, the classical term of the gradient of the force fields. So here we have the force fields amongst our molecules, but we've removed the solvent. So somehow that interaction of the solvent has to be built back in. So we put a, a friction factor 
into the, into the equation to take into account that these molecules would have been slowed down by the effect that the uh, solvent is mediated. But of course, if we put a friction factor and we start eliminating energy from our system, the whole system will eventually come to a standstill. So what we have to do is then add a, a, a noise, a white noise, which comes, which, which, which theoretically can be derived coming from the fluctuation uh, dissipation theorem. And we add some random noise to the system to get back a, a workable equation. The system cell is based on the exper uh, basically on the experiment. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a cartoon of the experiment, but basically has the key elements that we think are, are important for this system. Um, when we run the simulation in a coarse grain model, the first thing that we see is even then with this extremely aggressive coarse graining, it takes a lot of time for things to happen. Uh, at 10 nanoseconds of simulation, we just simply have very small clusters of polyamide forming. And these clusters start growing in size, finding other clusters, starting to span clus the clusters from across the cell, and eventually reach a certain size in which uh, the system then stops growing. Amongst other things, of course, you can recognize that some of the monomers simply can't diffuse after a while because there is a, a polymer membrane which has formed and physically blocks one of the reservoirs of one of the, of one of the monomers uh, to the other. And we have found in our simulations to that to be in the order of, in the order of 10, nan 10 nanometers plus minus a little bit. These are enormous simulations. They take, take uh, actually weeks and weeks of time just to see this. But the important thing is not that. The important thing for us was actually the, the atomistic detail of what was happening. This is what the experimentalists were yelling at us to please explain to us what's happening. So we had to then jump back a scale, take our coarse grain model, and since the coarse grain model is based on a, a physical representation, a coarse grain representation of a molecule, we can now, in place of those coarse grain model, put back the atomistic model where it was, relax the system, and obtain a fully atomistically detailed um, uh, model for this. Uh, amongst a few things that we are now testing is, is for example, things like the density and the, and the chemical compositions of these membranes and, uh, and comparing them to the experiments. And up to now, we have been uh, quite happy with the results we get. Um, yeah, the, next, the next step forward is to hydrate the molecule. And again, here comes our, our water or atomistic water molecules again. Um, one of the nice things that we can, we can see from, from this graph on the, on, on the right-hand side, uh, you can see a pathway for the water crossing that membrane. Uh, it's interesting to note that that, that that pathway actually wasn't there initially, and it, it, it starts appearing when we hydrate the, the membrane. So the water is somehow forcing its way through the membrane to go to the other side. So against, uh, against some conventional wisdom, it's not that the membrane has holes in it and water will go through the holes, but the water will somehow creep through the available space and make its way through the available space on, on this membrane, which in fact is not a rigid membrane, but actually has some flexibility and allows for that to happen. The, the, the dimensions of these membranes are commensurate with what uh, has been seen ex experimentally, and this is a, a copy of the recent science paper on, on, that, on that topic. So I hope to, to, with this to convince you that um, uh, of uh, at least some key ideas of what molecular modeling can do and, and hopefully what it can't do, which is probably more important. Um, and so in, in spite of, of the fact that computing power grows exponentially, uh, our, our appetite for the problems we want to tackle grows side by side. So we're always in, this, we're always in the problem that we, we want more and, and, and we want to do more. So we have to be creative. Uh, one, thing, one thing to do is, of course, to sit down and do nothing, because Moore's law just simply states that in two years' time, we'll have the double the computing power that we have today. Uh, but even that is, is, pro is probably not enough. In some of these cases, we really don't want to double the computing power. We want to increase it by an order of magnitude, several orders of magnitude. So we have to be a little bit creative about that. It is also unreasonable to expect that atomistic simulations, or DFT, depending on, on, on who you talk to, um, will ever be used to map all types of problems. This is, this is an unrealistic expectation. And um, we need to, again, find ways to use that information and scale it up so we can look at larger types of problems. And it's also obvious that different types of problems need different types of tools. And again, creativity here becomes interesting. And uh, more importantly, the use of multi-scaled or, or multiple analytical tools to understand 
multiple scales is, is actually probably going to be the key in, in, in recent years, in, in the future re years. I, I put this slide with some further reading for those of you that want to, to start on the basics of this, which was, uh, as, as I understood, part of the, of the audience. And uh, I'd like to finish with uh, just a slide acknowledging the people that actually did the work. All, this, all the work that you saw here was, was uh, done by well, several of these uh, researchers here. And to acknowledge also the uh, generous uh, um, financial support from EPSRC and, and ICAM uh, for this work. Okay, thank you very much.